All right, welcome everybody to our next, uh, our next show and tell at Mainframe. We do these monthly now. We've changed to a monthly cadence. Um, we are excited to share some, um, some progress with you, show you some things that we've been building and working on. And we're going to start with Clement. Clement, do you want to take it away and show us what you've got? Yes, great. So I'm going to show you um, guys a bit of the UI of the platform. So it is so the, the platform where we launch um, uh, decentralized applications. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, there you go. And so I will just show you the onboarding and then the main screen. So this will uh, probably change, like, well, definitely change in the, in the future. And so it's kind of like a first draft, like uh, UI stuff and uh, onboarding and, and play with like flat design with a bit of like shadows. So I'm going to show you and, and show you that. So you have like a welcome screen, uh, then people can create a password. Next one, when you create a password, you see like when it highlights a bit of like shadow, then when you have more than like eight characters, you can, you can save it. Uh, you can put also like create your identity, you enter your name, save, and then you see the, uh, uh, we call it like launcher mainframe terminal or mainframe. That's where you can see all the, the apps. You can install apps and we'll we will um enhance all the all of that in the, in the next coming weeks so for now in terms of the design we're in uh as i was saying we were using a, a a flat design with a bit of like shadows 3d uh like in on some like elements and we'll also like uh play with um uh animations uh, like more a bit of like interactive uh, 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 design so in the next coming weeks we'll be working on uh, on that and especially the design system so now that we have uh, uh, we're gonna work on like new wireframes and try to uh, put all that together and create a, a design system and have something very like co coherent uh, in terms of uh, this where we have all the applications but also in the uh, in the applications. So in the applications, we want to have the same feel, look and feel, and also like a system uh, for those applications. And especially for the developers, when we, they will create uh, dApps, we want to give them like tools, uh, give them guidelines to be able to quickly create something visually um, uh, nice and balanced. And without like having to think like uh, think too much uh, about it, and so stay tuned. Like in the next coming weeks, we'll we'll have more uh, more to show in that uh, uh, in that area. Awesome. Uh, I just had one question. The the name. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, you on that one screen, you put in a name. Um, we'll also have like that's where they'll put in their password for their vault, right? Is that is that kind of where that will happen? Yeah. Vault. So. So you put a password, you create a, a, a bolt, and then an identity. Oh, so and I got those steps reversed, right? Okay. So you, you first create a, a password, and within this password, this bolt, you can create multiple identities. Later, we'll, we'll be able to uh, maybe have multiple vaults. So similar to what we have, for example, on like Apple, like Windows, when you have <laughs> different... Uh, um, when you, you, you start the OS and you see different people, that we, you'll be able to, to start different vaults and those vaults will contain um, multiple identities, more like different depths. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll look at some of the wireframes that Blake has been working on to, to sort of talk about the ways that we can, different ways that we can use the terminal. This is, this is great stuff, it's looking really good. Any other questions for Clement? Um, so, uh... I understand, Clement, that, um, you know, and you probably saw yesterday how product is envisioning a sort of tighter integration mm -hmm. between some of the dApps and the actual mainframe terminal. So, yeah. for example, the address book might be almost look like it's a part of your terminal rather than a, a dApp that you have to, like, explicitly open up. 
Um, mm-hmm. uh, I assume that this is kind of like before any of that direction came to, came from them, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is prior to that, and especially to kind of like uh, start like drafting some like UI and see uh, to create the design system. You know, we kind of like need to iterate, you know, a couple of times and. And so that's yeah, the the first draft, and we'll we'll be uh, so uh, Jordan and I will be working on the new wireframes and uh, and make that uh, a bit more accurate. Excellent, yeah, no, we I really like the shape it's taking so far. It sounds like between you guys and product, um, there will be some tight uh, communication, I guess, in the next little while. Yeah, definitely. yeah, cool. Yeah, I think the 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 things that um, Blake and and I are kind of playing with with the the terminal or or sort of exploratory UX design stuff. Um, a lot of it still needs to be nailed down and and iterated through before we worry too much about look and feel. So um, anyway, we'll we'll get to that momentarily. But this yeah, is- absolutely. And and in my comments are mostly more focused on. Um, sort of approach than look and feel like just so um, more, more curious about like, you know, um, how we're planning on not necessarily like where you go to do something, but more the, the level of like tight, tight, how tightly integrated certain things are. But um, yeah, I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more discussion going forward. And this also reminds me that um, from on the engineering side, as you guys refine those concepts, um, obviously soon we're going to be discussing um, sort of like how to prioritize these features, right? Um, as well. So just because like we've seen this amazing, like these amazing concepts that look really awesome, but we're just thinking like, okay, wh- what can we actually get done for the first first release, you know? Yep. Cool. Anything else you want to show, Clement? Were you going to um, uh, gonna yeah. show, preview the homepage? Go ahead. Yeah, Jordan's going to show us like the, uh, the little preview of the uh, mainframe homepage. Okay. Um, Can you see my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. So here's the homepage that we have right now. Um, I think the main the main thing that we are trying to do is to update the content um, while still keeping the brand. And so here we just have added um, some different content and reorganized it. Um, so I'll just go through that so you can see. And then we also have added two new pages, the DAPS page, which <clears throat> will feature the DAPS that we make as well as the launcher or platform. Um, So this would be just a mock-up of the launcher and then the dApps that we build will be featured here. Uh, I I missed the very beginning of your comment, Jordan. Did you say this is uh, the developer portal that we're seeing now? Um, This is where like the dApps and the platform will be featured. <clears throat> okay. So this will replace the current uh, Onyx section, and Onyx will be integrated in this uh, section now. So we'll have like a more general, you know, dApps section, and we'll all the dApps in that section. So this this isn't necessarily intended for developers per se, but um, just like a general overview of our offering. Is that the idea, Clement? Yes. Okay. 
And then the second page that we have is the why page. Um, just to tell about mainframe. And so, um, again, we've just been updating the content. And I think it, it also has um, what would have been on the token page. I think that was moved over to this page as well. So. Yes, same uh, same thing as like DApps. So currently we have token uh, page. So this token page is now called Y. We still have a bit of like uh, a token section, and we've kept some of the things, but we've added uh, more content around the the Y mainframe. And so that's uh, uh, Jeff. Pete and all the marketing team has kind of like uh, been working on the on the content, and we've kind of like used the same branding and look and feel we already have on the website to to uh, to to do this. So you'll see on the like home page if you later you you have a look again on, uh, on this. We we've added a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of like new sections and just to make it. A bit more clear, have more info for people right away, and clear call to actions for like each section. And also, one thing maybe I can add to that is so we'll have a, um, uh, a second stage where we'll, uh, we'll have bigger visual updates. So, this <laughs> is so for this one is kind of like stage one, and we uh, put like new content reorganize a little bit the website. Stage two will be, uh, say it'll be like new visuals, new layouts, new, uh, mostly we say visual and layout as like this is more content uh, changes. This looks really great. Um, just one quick comment I wanted to make on the section that shows the different layers of the platform. Uh, I have a new graphic for that in my latest Upbit presentation, Clement, that I can share with you and Jordan. Yeah. We have a, now we have an identity um, column there as well as uh, the, the other ones that are there. I thought uh, we used that one. But yeah, if you can share that with us, we'll, we'll update it. Sounds good. Great, Jordan. Any other Thoughts or questions for Jordan or Clement? It's looking good, Jordan. Well done. Thanks. Um, let's let's keep it in in London and have uh, Adam. Do you want to go next or Paul, uh, whichever one? Yeah, I can. I can go. Use your mic or just this to share. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to work, walk through some of the developer functionality you've added to the launcher or the terminal. Um, you might notice there's none of like Clement's beautiful design in this. It's just UI I've sort of shut together as I've been building, so it's not going to look digitally too pleasing. Um, so this is like as you open the launcher in a user mode, but as a developer, you can switch in the bottom left here to a developer mode. This will allow you to like create your app and be able to test your app. So it's just going to ask for some details of your app. And then um, have you tell it where the app's contents are stored. So I'd expect like an uh, index.html file as the root. Um, but you can provide like the, the directory, all the contents. And then the developer identity, which I've already created here. And this is optional, but allow you to set permissions for your app. Um, it's got a few there. And just before you create your app, just give you a summary to check it's all good. So once you've created your app, you should be able to open it from the launcher. 
It's just asking to communicate. You mean with them. the mainframe terminal? Sorry, <laughs> terminal. We need to get it in. Um, Sorry for being a pest there. <laughs> and so yeah, you've got your your app here, and then if you wanted to go ahead and make changes, you can make changes. Um, as long as the bundle is updated that you've linked to, you can just refresh here and you'd see your refresh state of your app so you can see changes as you, um, in real time. Um, and then, I don't know, is it worth me walking through actually in, uh, publishing the app? We've uh, demoed it before, it's still just um, commands from the terminal on the command line, so I'm not sure if this worth demoing or... Sure, I, th I think there's a lot of new people that haven't seen it maybe yet. I, I also wanted to ask, was that just like a command R refresh that you did? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, it would be the same thing as just closing and reopening the app. Okay, yeah, so I'll walk through publishing the app contents and write a manifest file that can be used for installing. Mm -hmm. Just gonna. So, first, you can, there's a command to, to see which apps you've created list your apps and I can see this is the app I'm after here. So I'm gonna just take this ID and then there's command to publish contents which will upload the bundle to Swarm and pr uh, provide you with a Swarm hash which will then be attached to your app in the vault. Adam, I don't know if it's on all screens but I can't see that line that you're typing. It's just hidden by the bottom of the... Um... Let me do this. There we go, there we go. So yeah, that was like app list, then app publish contents. And then once you've published it, there you can see it's provided us with a swarm hash. Um, and it's also attached that swarm hash to our app. So if we want to write a manifest file, um, it's this command here, change ID. Okay, then it's produced as a manifest file which we can then use to install. So I'm just going to run the terminal again. What was that hash um, that you had on the command line? Was that the apps hash? That was the swarm hash, yeah, representing the location of the apps contents on swarm. Okay. Does that, does that hash point to a manifest file of any kind as well, or do you have to like download the, the blob and then uh, like unzip it to get the manifest or is the manifest in a different place altogether? Yeah, the manifest was just local um, That was just the contents of the app So uh, but eventually though your manifest will basically be a pointer to where one can download the the swarm you know from the storage layer the um, The contents of the app, right? So that's what the manifest does. Yeah as of so, now, exactly. So I guess what I'm asking is, when you're deploying the the DAP, do you you don't yet know what that uh, content hash is going to be? So I guess do you have to up, update your manifest after you deploy so it? That does it automatically? So when I uploaded the content, I provided my app ID. So once it gets a swarm hash, then it attaches that um, swarm hash to your app ID automatically. And then so when you manifest file, those details are already stored in the vault and it uses those details to uh, create the manifest. Uh, okay, so the manifest isn't created yet until you actually deploy. Is that the yeah. idea? Yeah, so okay. there's a public step and then um, a write manifest step. Cool. Okay, so yeah, back on like the user facing side, um, we can install the app from using that manifest we just created in here. Let's just ask for these permissions that we'd set as requirements on creating the app. Then we can see our app displayed and it should. Sorry that with changes, uh, <laughs> I was just me mm -hmm. testing something. Um, but yeah, so that's that's the flow of creating an app from the developer and install the app as a user. I'm curious, uh, these little visual graphs that we see in there, is that just kind of um, the content of your, your actual DAP? What, sorry? Uh, the Onyx DAP? 
Yeah, Onyx stats. Is that's the DAP itself? That's um, Onyx staking stats. That's statistics of how, how often people have staked for Onyx. Yeah, so that's the content of your DAP, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. I okay, didn't cool. generic to all, all DAP. But yeah. It's really cool. What graphing library did you use? Um, I can't remember the React graph library. But yeah, that's that's pretty nice. There's lots of like customization you can do with it. Nice. So can uh, you double click on the Onyx Stats DAP again? I'm just curious about something. Yeah. Uh, it, oh, okay. So it opens a new window, and basically the entire contents of that window are belong to the the DAP, right? Um, only the contents inside the app container. So inside this web view. So this yeah. bar at the top, for example, that's like trusted UI outside of the app content. I see. Yeah, and because um, one of the things we've been considering is the idea that the the mainframe terminal is just a single window, but you've kind of got the concept here of like it, that each DAP opens a new window, right? I assume that um, either option wouldn't drastically alter the design of our terminal, right? Um, I mean, it will have sort of, it will have a, an effect on how we like architect the terminal and it's quite a big decision. I think if we do decide to have like windows or tabs or a mix of both. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, sure I mean, Carl, there was a thread, me. there's a thread in Slack. I shared a few thoughts. Uh, it seems to me like the, the best UI is one that, and I know this is not the least amount of work, but the one that would allow for somebody to open up a window, because I can see there could be plenty of use cases where you want both applications kind of running, you know, perhaps side by side, maybe you've got a messaging app on one, you've got something else on another, and you, you don't want to have to be limited Constantly. to what you can see. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think that it, like a browser, probably this, the idea of, either tabs or new windows would be would be the direction we want to go is be able to support either scenario yeah eventually but that, anyway that looks great i know i'm getting ahead of myself but yeah good job. that's great adam. adam on the stuff that you did on the command line and, yeah. and is there are we thinking of ways to also have some sort of user interface around that, or is that just because it's so it's such so few steps that it's like ah, it doesn't matter? No, no, that that will be um, integrated in the launcher and UI as well at some point. It was just for a zero point one release. That's that, that that's the amount of features we sort of lined up. So cool. We don't want to that right now. Yeah, yeah. We eventually may have been talking anyway about having a lot of visual tools for developers to use that will kind of help them through the process of development in all its phases. Great. Good stuff. <coughs> Questions for Adam before we turn it over to Paul? All right, Paul, go ahead. Or, uh, can you hear me like this? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. Um, so what I've been working on last uh, last month has been adding support for uh, subscriptions and notifications in the different uh, pieces of the stack which is essentially having not only the ability from the SDK or from the launcher to make requests to the daemon, but also uh, create stateful uh, subscriptions so that the daemon can be pushing information to, um, to the launcher and to the trusted window and in, and in turn to the apps themselves. Um, and so essentially the practical application for this is to have a real-time interaction such as uh, a chat, which is the, the obvious one. And so um, I ported the um, Swarm Chat prototype that we worked on a few months ago to 
um, to in in the SDK, uh, just providing some of the some of the methods so that um, it could be could be experimented with to to check this behavior. So here I have my app. Not using it. And so essentially, uh, this is all like really made for Swarm Chat rather than and made for the browser rather than uh, mainframe itself. So it's not really representative of how how the ETSDK is actually going to work. Um, but it's showing essentially showing the flow. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, way around. So here I have my other client in, in my browser, and I need to have access to the public key. So I have two swarm nodes currently running on my machine, and I will add the contact, and I should see the invite here on the other one. So from there, I can start actually communicating between uh, the different clients. So here we are receiving messages from an external peer that is, well, here it's only on the machine, but that could be on the other side of the world, it should work with it the same way. And having some real-time interaction between, between the two. Um, so yeah, essentially, essentially that's it for for notification, so really, as it is now, is as a proof of concept, um, I, at least in terms of, of the communication features, uh, there are lots of things that are not gonna, gonna work with it. Uh, but at least the notification and subscription themselves uh, are, are implemented this way. That's fantastic, Paul. Um... A quick, quick question. I was trying to understand the significance of having two swarm nodes. Is that just to prove that the nodes themselves are communicating, or uh... so it's because we we need to have each each node has its own address. So to have communication between two peers, we need to have two different nodes, right? Otherwise, if you have a single node, you would, you, you can't. I mean, you would have different clients, but acting as the same entity. That makes sense. So is, is the, um, so the client identities or I identifiers are um, those long swarm hashes and do they include their nodes in them? Is that part of what's going on? Yeah, so that session essentially is a swarm address uh, that is created by the swarm node itself. Okay, cool. I had a more basic question. Um, I want to I want to make sure I capture the the significance of what you just showed, Paul. So, is this? It, I understand kind of the, the obviously the basic concept in, of notifications. Is this something that that an app, a DAP, would be able to access via the the comms SDK, or is this just more like a another? I don't I don't know how how, how might a developer utilize something like this in theory. Um, so it's not really part of the comms SDK, it's more a generic feature of the SDK that would allow to have generic subscriptions around anything. So it could be coming from notifications, but if we had other features such as uh, watching for file changes uh, or, or something like that, as long as we can have this information pushed from anywhere in, in the services, we have this ability then to dispatch this information to the app that wants to be notified about it. Yeah, it's like handling asynchronous actions that are happening outside of the DAP itself. So, uh, for example, like most websites don't, or well, like old style websites are static content. They, nothing, if something happens in real time, it doesn't update until you manually refresh. And then this is about creating like a framework for uh, like managing or like it creates a channel for asynchronous updates to be fed into the DAP. That was uh, that was cool how your voice just came out of nowhere. 
you've been watching us all this whole time from above. Oh, from the side. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Julia has a pretty deep voice. <laughs> <laughs> So, so if I'm understanding right, this is something that could be integrated into lots of different service layers to notify of all kinds of things, right? Uh, yes, exactly. So it's more a kind of a feature of, of the platform stack of communication between the different pieces that can uh, go not only from the higher level, from the apps to down, down the stack, but also the other way around. Very cool. I can also imagine some scenarios where these notifications can be very important, like something, I mean, just something that jumps out at me is like the idea that, you know, uh, the user has logged out or, <laughs> you know, something important happened and you, your DAP needs to react to it, right? So um, this could be more than just something convenient, but uh, something that's necessary for DAPs to do any cleanup or any kind of you know important reaction that they need to make to system-wide events that's exciting that's really cool stuff any other questions for paul all right i think next on the docket if i, I don't have the doc in front of me right now um sarah are you ready You, you're still muted. Okay, there you go. Hear me now? Yeah. I'm yeah. Now you're good. Um, except I didn't. I gotta make sure it's sharing the right thing here. There we go. Desktop two. Okay. Can you see the screen here? Not yet. No. Oh. I have to choose it. And share it. There we go. Okay. Better. Now it's on. So I um, have just kind of been working on a little uh, reference step to um, test out integration with a couple different services and um, through various um, hoops jumping, I, it is kind of working now. I don't know, you know, that it's a very good proof of utility of any of the services, just that I was able to do it. So, um, okay, so this integrates Erebos and Bluezell for data storage and, um, and Morpheus UI. So, um, what we can do here, we're going to copy, this is Shane's abstract. Okay, first of all, my, my username will um, populate the database. So I can see this is my list of things that I've already stored in the database. And this is um, Bluezell's little um, UI application that kind of shows similarly um, what's stored in my database already. Um, so I can add a new note, and I'll add a, a label for it, and save it. Now that is saved um, in the uh, in Swarm, and so what I have in my database is actually a. I'm just keeping track of this the hash. So um, here's the hash. And we can verify here that it's stored in Swarm, and that's the text back. So I also can see my listing of notes here and can select one. Forgive the uh, UI experience. I, this is also my very first React app ever. So um, anyway, so yeah, select this and retrieve it, and there's the text of the, um, actually that was the wrong one. There's the text of the abstract. So kind of round trip that we're showing that we can store um, the document in Swarm using Erebos. Uh, we can store the hash in Bluezell and we can get a listing of, um, of all of our uh, keys in Bluezell, we can select one and hand it back to Erebos to download the content 
from Swarm. All the while using buttons from Morpheus UI. <laughs> Are there any more buzzwords we could throw in there, maybe? <laughs> Um, I am terminal in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No mainframe terminals here. This is a, a, a pure browser app running in Chrome. Um, I am running a local swarm node and a local Bluezell uh, node or local Bluezell swarm. So um, those two swarms are completely unrelated, by the way. Um, <laughs> so one one thing I wanted to say that is really great about what you're doing here, Sarah, is um, uh, it, remind, it reminds me of this article that Dwayne shared not too long ago called uh, The Rat versus the MVP, which was like riskiest assumptions test versus uh, like minimum viable product. And it's the idea that like rather than spending your time like polishing and perfecting something to this that's a, a, a bigger task, something that's going to take you a longer time. Uh, focus first on the things that you're unsure of, the things that you're wor most worried about, that you don't know if they, they're possible or not. Mm -hmm. And just write something really basic that can get those things working and, and eliminate your, your doubts and concerns around those things. So I think yeah, the work you're doing here is really handy in that respect. Cool. Well... Um, yeah, it was definitely a very good exercise for me, and I did in the process have to dig into the swarm code a little bit. Doug helped point me in the right direction there, um, since I wasn't able to get kind of round tripping working in my um, app, and so I um, am, am running off of their uh, release branch with a couple slight modifications that I've inserted. So, anyway. It looks good, Sarah. It, Kaylin, it seems like we've already got a couple of our dApps built. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. The only thing that's missing is this isn't in developer mode in the terminal, and then we'd, yeah. be, we'd be there. <laughs> also, I, I can't quite explain yet why it's better to store, you know, the content in Swarm and the hash in Bluezell. Like, none of that really makes sense, but, you know, it's possible. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's true that, like, you're – you could have stored the text in Bluezell as well, right? Yeah. But I do think that um, at least our assumption is that uh, the idea is that the database is ideally suited for small chunks and then Swarm is better for big static chunks, right? Yeah, so. and I, I'm sure there will be an economic component at some point once any of these people start charging for things. Um, yeah. That'll be a consideration and uh, and performance and whatever um, and also uh, indexing and searching you know will be a player as well. So anyway, that's as <clears throat> maybe a quick question. As a database, um, there there wouldn't be an external way to access uh, yeah. the content, right? Whereas with Swarm, you would be able to at least have a some kind of gateway to access the information. I, I'm imagining a public sharing, you know. Uh, index of, of files that I've shared or something like that where I want to keep the index private but the public links are available for others to download something like that yeah so they'll have uh, in the next release for Bluezell they'll include write permissions um, with the kind of idea that read would be public so um, at this point anyone who has your um, kind of database ID could read Anything in it? Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but one consideration. Yeah, maybe partially. I think maybe where I, where I was going with that was Web 2.0 um, has no way to reach into Bluezell at this point, whereas oh, oh right, Web oh. 2 has uh, a way to reach into Swarm. <laughs> Just a, a bridge, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, there's this. There, they have a CLI tool, and they have uh, this little. Um, uh, electron visibility, you know, uh, visualizer. So, I mean, there's things like that. But. Cool. So my, my only question, Sarah, is like, as you're going through this, this process and sort of figuring these things out and, and seeing how all this works, has this helped you think initially about any uh, problems or ways that we can tackle? I, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm curious, how has this helped your thinking, if at all, about how we're going to be building dApps? Like, 
I don't know, just um, anything I, it helps I, you with. Well, I, I think that that wasn't really my thought process as I was going into it. I mostly was, it was really just was an exercise and kind of a proof of concept that it was possible. But I think um, it's exposed questions for me more than anything, just as far as um, when it's appropriate to use this type of storage and when it's appropriate to use these tools and whatever. And um, so I guess I, I realized kind of the importance of not only being able to answer those questions ourselves, but then also communicate the, that kind of thought process to the app developers so that we can kind of help guide them through, um, you know, their, their own choices. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have the answers to those, but I at least kind of can see like that we need to, I, I need to more fully understand the trade-offs of each of them to be able to kind of recommend this, you know, one for different scenarios or whatever. What, one important thing that we have discovered, um, Kaylin, is that we've discovered some of the limitations in um, s some of these services, uh, especially like, for example, BlueZell doesn't currently support encryption. Um, uh, so there's no privacy of any kind in terms of uh, being able to, at least nothing provided by, by BlueZell directly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. Well, so yeah, they, they encrypt themselves kind of before and after it's uh, retrieved or set, you know, so it, within their system it's, it's encrypted, but not in a way that I alone have access to. Does that make sense? So anyone can request your database, right? And read yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So, um, so basically one of the things we've learned, Kaylin, is that if we, some of the features that we consider to be fairly essential are things that perhaps if we really, you know, depending on how essential we consider them to be, um, we may need to provide sort of, um, make it so that our API does those at higher levels rather than, um, those being offered by some of the underlying service layers. So uh, one common case that I could see is that, you know, you want to keep the contents of your database private. So what we do is we provide some, we make our API very convenient, very easy to use, where you don't have to think too hard about encrypting everything manually yourself, but we would have to implement that, um, that piece of it at a, at a higher level. And the other thing that that helps us, has helped us solidify our thinking around is that like, because each service layer may have a different subset of features that it provides, um, it kind of makes sense that we, I mean, we're adding value as mainframe by creating a uniform SDK that gives the user the same experience regardless of which service layer they decide to use, if that makes sense. Sure. Any other questions for, for Sarah? Okay, um, I'll quickly show something that I think is probably the most important demo you're gonna see today. Clearly, uh, this, is, this is something that I've become so passionate about that I think we should ship it with our mainframe stage initially, like no questions asked, this has to happen. So let me just share my screen really quickly. And uh, drum roll. <laughs> This is very important. As an accredited investor, I approve of this. <laughs> All right, I may have to go out of uh, the, the recording the, that Zoom is doing is is making things a little bit difficult here. Give me just a second. It messes with my desktops. Okay, here we go. So. Um, Desktop one. So it looks like it will only let me see one desktop. So I might need to move this to a separate desktop. Hold on one second. Here we go. Drums are getting noisy. I know. <laughs> the, the, the tensions is too great. Uh, can everybody see? Can everybody see my screen? Is that showing up? Not yet. Okay. That's your face. Yeah. Desktop one, share. How about now? Yeah, now. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we we all knew it was going to happen. We we knew that we knew that fart daps were coming. Uh, 
And I just thought I would get out ahead of the, the masses of developers that were going to be doing this. And so I built my own very, very technical, lots of code took me lots of late nights to build this. Um, and so I just wanted to show you this important dap. <laughs> so the, I'm worried about the audio being able to catch this, this sound, but I'm going to try to help give you a, a good preview of what's going on here. Let's see. <laughs> you even have different ones. You, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and you didn't see the UI. Where did you get those sounds? I hope you didn't make it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. And I, I, that was actually part of the demo because the sounds are coming from an outside web call. And I actually already allowed permanently the access to that web call. So you don't see the UI that pops up that asks you if it's okay if you play an external site sound uh, from Sound Bible is actually the domain. Uh, but there were plenty of sounds I used from that website. Um, but yeah, I, I think this DAP is is ready to go. We just need to package it up and ship it with the, with the uh, terminal and so did got you something say powerful. That, um, you were prompted properly by the terminal to accept yes. an, an external connection? Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. when, yeah, so yeah when, cool. when you first click the button, it asks if you want to allow, um, you know, web, uh, a, a call to that um, sound Bible domain. And then you hit allow and I accidentally hit allow and don't ask again. And so that's why it didn't, it didn't show up uh, from earlier. If you create another identity and you open the same app, it's probably going to ask again, right? Yeah, That's probably. Yeah, let me try, yeah, try to a different one. Just look at what your hands have wrought, Adam and Paul. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I, I mean, in all honesty, though, I, I think it's, an, you know, I felt it, it was important for me to just kind of get an idea of, you know, how this works. I, I've seen Adam and Paul uh, demonstrate this, but it was just helpful for me to go through the process myself and 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 try to put myself in the position of a future web dap developer and uh so it was it was very useful for me i still have a bunch to learn about how the process works it's not on swarm you know i haven't been able to get it uploaded to swarm and installed via manifest or anything yet but um uh it, i'm sure i'm sure we'll get there once we we probably need to take lots of clemence time now to design a really good interface around this uh, so <laughs> Certainly. How would you even improve that? I mean, <laughs> it's pretty solid, and uh, way to get out there and grab that first mover advantage, Caitlin. Well, that you know, I, I am in front of the market. I am a gold effects. rush developer. I'm I'm one of those per personas. I'm a gold rush developer. I see the opportunity, and here it is. This is it. I need yeah. some. I need some three D visualizations. <laughs> <laughs> good thing we have a good editing department. Yes. <laughs> True. I don't know if anyone else is watching Binance, but our coin price is <laughs> taking off right now. <laughs> cool. What Do you thing? remember Google knows that uh, April Fools? I don't Google remember. Knows. That. that was a joke from Google that they 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 said they they just released a. A feature that you could smell your screen and feel everything, oh. and it was a, like an April Fools uh joke so if it was true we could integrate it it would be great <laughs> <laughs> mellow vision i think or something. So. well done kaylin hey, well done well, I'll, I'll take i'll take credit for the pump of the week even though telephonic was probably well this almost, might need its own blog post you yeah, need to polish the ui a little bit and make that its <laughs> own blog post it's very true this is exciting though guys to see um to see just like real little steps being taken on the mainframe platform. So awesome work, everybody. I mean, it seems, it, yeah, it seems like one of the big steps that we need to take is try to get the terminal or whatever we're ending up calling it, at least to a, an MVP state so that we can kind of start seeing these dApps, you know, live there, whether it's the fart dApp or anything else, just so that it, try to get it to a point where <clears throat> we can start experiencing these dApps, even people who aren't developers, you know, get Matt and Brad to start seeing what's 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 in this terminal and and using even these basic dApps that are getting built like it'd be great if we can try to get that to a point where we can do that
Yeah, I think what we could do is probably um, create a really simple, just sort of like internal mainframe DAP list DAP that everybody can install in their launcher uh, in their in their terminal, excuse me, and then they can see what other DAPs are there. I don't know. We we can figure out a way to to sort of have a repository, so sort of a pseudo marketplace of of DAPs yeah. that you can use, right? I think one easy step that could get us close to that is if we had file associations so that if you double clicked on a manifest, it would just open it up in, in the, the terminal and it would know, it would prompt you to what at, you know, whether you wanted to install it or not. I think if we could get to that point, um, and also the point of packaging, a, a, a you know, bundling some kind of the bundling the mainframe terminal in, into an installable, you know, package. I think those two steps of like file associations and a bundle for the mainframe terminal would get us to that point. So that maybe is something we can prioritize as an engineering team. <clears throat> cool. Well, thanks for humoring me there. Um, let's, uh, Blake, do you want to show us some of the wireframes that you've been working on to, to kind of show everybody some of the things I'll just kind of preface this by saying that, uh, Blake, I, I've been working a little bit with him, but Blake has mostly been doing most of the, th uh, the, the design and the thinking here. Blake's been thinking a lot about the dApps that we're building and, and sort of the overall um, UX, uh, the, the context in which those dApps will live in the terminal and how they're going to be used in the dApps themselves and the UI and everything. And so some of this looks like it conflicts a little bit with what Clement is doing, but it's really just more kind of very rough and raw sketches from a UI perspective, or sorry, from a UX perspective on what, what is the user experience, like which, which dApps make sense and what, in what places and, and, and how should the user experience those dApps. And so, uh, Blake, do you want to show us what you've been working on? Yeah, you bet. Um, yeah. And I actually think that, um, <clears throat> it's not going to really contradict too badly with the direction Colmont was already going. Um, it's a UI. But is that coming through okay? Can you guys see that? Yep. Looks good. So, uh, yeah, is this just starting to come together? Uh, Sketch doesn't like working with Zoom for some reason, it always freezes. Um, Lame. Sorry, I got the pinwheel of death going right now. Uh, yeah, so this is probably too small for you guys to see. We can see um, little thumbnails uh, of your screen, so you might as well uh, just talk us through what you, what we can see. It disappeared now, but yeah, I just uh, relaunched Sketch. So. Oh, okay. Um, Okay. Is that coming through now? Yeah. Do you guys see that? Okay, so um, so uh, trying to uh, move this forward and start to also think about onboarding and what a new user's experience would be in getting into the DAP. So following that there's uh, only a requirement for a password and a name for your first default identity that gets created in your vault that is created when you create your, when you sign up and, and start using the terminal for the first time. Um, so you would be taken through this onboarding registration flow and then this would all collapse maybe over right to left, what individuals we don't have to worry about. But you'd come into um, an experience more like this screen actually here, where you see that this side panel on the left is all collapsed. And zooming in, you'll notice that uh, we have a few things. One, you have the mainframe logo, which is the default jump back to your terminal dashboard, which will just be a launching, uh, geez. Sorry, pinwheel again. But this would just be the launching screen for the different dApps that you have installed. Um, this is a big placeholder of how we're going to make the most value for the user out of this dashboard screen. We don't know yet. For now, it's just basically an iOS launch screen or an Android launch screen type of uh, type of experience. 
Um, but as we've started talking about the different dApps that would exist on the terminal, um, uh, a lot of you are privy to this conversation. We've started moving in the direction of there are a few core system dApps that are fundamental to the terminal experience. And those we've identified so far are uh, a dApp for controlling and managing your identity and personal information, a dApp for managing all of your crypto assets in one place, and a dApp for housing all of your connections and contacts that you have made within the mainframe environment, um, all also in one place. Uh, the thought being that as you use these different third-party dApps, you will connect to different people, you will transfer different types of tokens and currencies, um, you will reveal different pieces of your identity to the different third-party dApps. So having those different bits of data stored in one mainframe controlled centralized place, we believe, uh, we're, we're the current thinking is that that is going to provide the most um, seamless experience for an end user who needs to drop this information into the different third-party dApps, but it also provides a better experience for a, a developer building a dApp uh, in our platform because they can leverage SDKs for these three different pieces of, of data, of user data. Um, it also provides uh, an opportunity for us to like make sure that that information is all insulated and protected and it's only being shared with third-party developers and third-party dApps in a way that is secured and uh, and we can communicate to the user uh, reassurances that, that they know that their data is being protected and secured. Um, so those uh, central core dApps would be separated from the rest of the dApps that would get installed. Uh, and um, the current direction for this is that those installed third-party dApps would be listed here on the left. Uh, and you could just either open or launch them or toggle between their windows using this side panel the way you do with different um, uh, channels and discussions on, uh, say, a Slack. Um, we're still uh, you know, debating, uh, it's been mentioned before uh, already on this call, uh, of how we'll handle the, the multiple dApps being open at the same time, whether that's through, um, through tabs or through separate windows or through just a, you know, controlling with this left hand, uh, left hand panel um, to swap in between them. And my screen's frozen, so I need to restart Sketch one more time to show you what the panel does. Oh, you know what, I'm just gonna show JPEGs so it doesn't crash anymore. Um, okay, so now uh, with these system dApps, um, uh, an idea that uh, we're pressure testing right now would be you can click into one of these core system dApps and this um, mainframe panel on the left would slide over and you would not lose your context from the third party dApp that you were using when you needed to go and reference this information. So I could click my wallet, it could slide out like this and I could you know, get a, a view of my wallet, I could do some basic interactions uh, from this panel here that slides out, and I could click to collapse that back and then still stay with this in this context of the mainframe terminal in this uh, example. Um, that would extend to things like contacts and you know, what the contacts identity cards uh, contain and what you can do with it is uh, another feature set that we're still refining. But in this view, you see kind of this aspirational DAP marketplace for us where we have enough DAPs to have categories and feature DAPs and things like that. So that would be, you know, it's very much down the road aspirational. But um, you'll see that uh, I have clicked the get more DAPs over on the left. That's why that is dark. And then when I was in that, I opened up my contacts for who knows why. And uh, here you see Mr. Pink. Um, 
it, it is showing me that I have connected with this identity, Mr. Pink, on four separate dApps. Those dApps are pay more, polls and voting, file vault, and kitty clash. And uh, potentially even we could have some shortcut um, common action launched directly from the address book into those maybe. Uh, again, these are down, these are not MVP features. This is trying to look ahead of where we might want to go so that we make smart decisions now as we're, as we're defining our MVP uh, features and requirements. Um, so uh, that is that. Uh, just on this call, as we were on this call, I added a developer mode toggle down here by the settings in the bottom left of the mainframe panel. Um, so that was wallet, contacts, and then identity. So the way we are currently talking about a user's identity is um, not so much that I have uh, different aliases, which is a word that I have been using, but rather that your quote unquote identity is a superset of all of the different names you have used with third-party dApps inside of mainframe and they all get collected in one place for quick reference. Email addresses, avatars, whatever personal information you are sharing with third-party dApps, it all kind of gets collected and organized for quick reference within your uh, identity dApp. And you could even potentially say, oh, this email address, I've used it three times and uh, it is currently being accessed by these dApps. Um, uh, a future feature that we're going to flush out that came up in a conversation yesterday uh, potentially would be when I have this, an app open like this one here, Onyx Lite, potentially having what identity information Onyx Lite is accessing flagged somehow in here for, for a quick reference. Um, so that's, that's something that we'll still need to, to bake a bit further. Um, one of the reasons that I like the direction of this left-hand panel, uh, there's, there's a few. One, it's gonna be, uh, lend itself really well to a responsive environment, and it, you know, with different viewport widths, if you're even on a desktop or a tablet, it could collapse down to be just a stack of icons, uh, and so it can be super minimalized, and, and but still there for quick reference. It pops out, uh, without losing your context uh, for whatever you're currently doing, whatever your workflow is. And, um, and yeah, so that's kind of uh, the current work in progress. Uh, these just started coming into existence over the weekend. So this is still very, very preliminary uh, look under the hood, but, uh, or behind the curtain rather. And that, but that's uh, kind of a snapshot of the, the wireframes for the terminal and, and how they're starting to take shape. Any thoughts or feedback, things that you hate or love or hate? It's looking really good. I'm excited to see how this all integrates as we, uh, you know, bring in Clement's work and, um, yeah. uh, you know, several different iterations later. I think this is going to be really amazing. Yeah, I think so too. Once we get there, the, the real good artists on this, I think it could turn into something really special. So I'm, I'm feeling really excited about the, the progress we're starting to make. Yeah, well done, Blake. It's a, this is exciting. I think if, if we can pull, pull even just a fraction of this off and execute on this, this is really exciting. This is, these are some big ideas we have. This and all of these, all of these show and tells, not just this one, but all of them, they're exciting. Mm -hmm. My master plan is taking shape. <laughs> Cue maniacal <laughs> laughter. <laughs> nice. You all sound so nice. It doesn't match. <laughs> Your laughter is so nice. <laughs> I know. I swear our engin engineering team is like the kindest group of people I've ever worked with. It's, it's wild. But the business team, on the other hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're a bunch of jerks. All of them. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that's our, we've gone well over our, our time, which is great. I think we've had a lot of good demos and, and uh, cool stuff going on. Exciting stuff. Anything, anybody else want to want to bring up here at the end? Are we going to show anything related to Morpheus UI this time? Or? Oh, that's right. We talked about that Diogo. Um, 
I, I think let's keep it maybe for next time, if that's okay, just because it, I don't think Morpheus UI uh, is going anywhere. I'm sure you're going to continue working on it, but with something we can maybe show next time, is that okay? Yeah, sure. No problem. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody for participating. Thanks for everybody who showed something. Um, we'll, we'll slice and dice up the video and, and make sure this is something we can push out to the community. Um, thanks for your participation. We'll talk to you soon.